Okay, I think we should get started again. We have finished our interesting morning ahead. Uh, next, we have two shorter talks to, to hear from uh, local folk. And the first one is being given by Dr. Andrew Sheet, who is uh, the um, head of transfusion medicine in the laboratory for Van Co Vancouver Coastal Health. And Andrew's based down at uh, Vancouver General. He comes to us from uh, his transfusion medicine training in, in Hamilton. And we're very glad to have him here in Vancouver instead of in Ontario. And, it, and Andrew's going to talk to us about the AB Plasma Appropriateness Index as a tool for improved AB Plasma transfusion practice. Andrew. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, so as I uh, said before, I'm Andrew C. I'm the regional uh, transfusion lead over at Vancouver Coastal. And I'd like to thank uh, Ed and Dana and the rest of CBR for uh, allowing us to present on this project. Um, I'd also like to thank the BC PBCO for helping us out with this project and uh, Dr. Shadi Al Khan, who was one of our previous transfusion medicine fellows, who was really instrumental in getting this project off the ground. And uh, she'll be presenting on our behalf at ISBT as an oral presentation. So uh, Dr. Andrew Beckett already kind of went through this slide and much more, but it, just to give you a little bit of background, many of you know that O red blood cells are the universal donor for red blood cells. But for plasma, the universal donor is group AB. So all patients can receive group AB plasma, but AB patients can only receive group AB plasma. Uh, this is potentially an issue because, um, as mentioned before, in massive hemorrhage, we're, now we're starting to use not just red blood cells and crystalloid, but we're also starting to use a balanced ratio of, of red blood cells, plasma, and platelets. This, is, uh, in, this increasing AB plasma usage is an issue since only 3 to 4 percent of donors are AB, and this reduces uh, supply for AB patients. So trauma centers, including many in the United States, are starting to increasingly use group A plasma in their massive transfusion protocols. Um, and this was most recently uh, published in uh, the STAT study, which came in transfusion uh, last year, which involved about 14 to 15 um, uh, level one trauma centers that used group A plasma and found that it was safe. So uh, our aims for this quality improvement project were uh, that we hypothesized that Vancouver General Hospital, being a level one trauma center here in BC, transfused a disproportionately high amount of AB plasma to non-AB patients. And we thought we could mitigate this through improving our massive transfusion protocols. And just to give you reference, a massive transfusion protocol at VGH is something called a trauma exsanguination protocol. So here are the methods. We collected data on all AB plasma units utilized from January 2016 to February 2017. And we took data from two different sources. We took uh, BC hospital data from the BC uh, PBCO for quality assurance. And we also had detailed indication data through chart and LIS review at Vancouver General Hospital. Among other things, we calculated for each institution something called the AB appropriateness index. And what this is, it's the ratio of appropriate use of AB plasma, that is, it's transfused to AB patients or those with unknown blood group, over the total AB plasma utilized, which is AB units transfused in general, um, those that are expired or discarded. And here are results for the 14-month provincial data. So we found that see about 46% of AB plasma goes to group AB patients and subsequently the most other common blood groups that are transfused to are group A and group O, which is consistent with the recipient population that you would typically see. About 3% of uh, AB plasma is transfused to those with unknown blood group. When we benchmark our hospital against six other hospitals in BC, we were found we were on the lower end of appropriateness when it comes to the ABAI. And um, uh, so we found we only transfused about a third of our AB plasma to, non, uh, to AB patients. And I can say since we're one of the larger users, we were probably dragging down the overall average to, uh, for BC, so apologies for that. Um, so what did we do about this? So we intervened and we changed to group A plasma for our trauma exsanguination protocols. And what was the rationale for this? Well, we did a preliminary look at 2016 data for uh, AB plasma that was transfused to non-AB patients. And we found more than half of it was transfused just because it was going, getting close to expiry. So we were transfusing just simply so we wouldn't throw it away. So how is this the case? Well, for our trauma exsanguination protocols, the first cooler that goes down to the trauma bay has four units of red blood cells and four units of plasma. We keep it pre-thawed to make sure we can get it down to the trauma bay faster. 
And in this pre-thaw, um, it expires within five days. So simply, we transfuse it to patients that are in the group non-AV simply to prevent wastage. Therefore, we decided to change to a four-pack of A plasma in our first cooler in June 2017. Um, thawed A plasma could often be transfused to group A patients without being wasted, and we anticipated through this process that we would uh, save about 50% of our AV plasma utilization. So here are the results of the intervention. So we decided to take a six-month period comparing pre and post. So our pre-period was 2016 to 2017, and to, our post-period was 2017 to 2018. And we decided to use the same six-month period to prevent uh, or to reduce seasonality as a confounder. And we found that our ABAI went from 0.44 to 0.94. And we thought, wow, this is absolutely amazing. You know, I was imagining already what I was going to wear to my, like, showing at Oprah and Ellen. <laughs> but I took a step back and thought a little bit harder and thought, you know, we should take a closer look at this. So we found that plasmapheresis accounted for 86% of the percent of our usage in the post-intervention period. So in summary, AV plasma use in higher, high user AV patients can skew the ABAI. So what we decided to do was we decided to remove Plex from these results, and we found that overall, we found a decrease in use of AV plasma in general. So the total units transfused went from 377 to 104, and the total units thawed went from 416 to 132. And in addition, we found an increase appropriateness of uh, use in AB patients. So our ABI went from 0.36 to 0.63. So in conclusion, um, I, I present to you the ABI as a potential benchmarking tool that probably still needs a little bit of refinement. Uh, it's limited by high plasma users, such as plasma phoresis, skewing the ABI. And its skew is much more dramatic in centers with low plasma utilization, obviously. Um, so therefore, like many other things, you need multiple key quality indicators to assess plasma transfusion appropriateness. In addition, I think solutions really need to be individualized to centers. So adoption of A plasma may not apply to other hospitals, and it's not the panacea. Um, I would actually argue, as uh, Yulia Lin presented, that really education and getting at the prescriber is probably where you get the most bang for your buck, to be honest. And uh, changes likely need to be multimodal to improve appropriateness of plasma transfusion. Uh, based off of this now, though, uh, Group A plasma is now used exclusively at VGH for the trauma exsanguination protocols. And we found anecdotally that the previous hesitancy to thaw Group AB plasma, which was seen as a rare resource, um, has decreased. And this has led to faster uh, thawing of plasma and faster delivery. And therefore, now it's feasible to now use a pneumatic tube system to continually deliver pods of blood products to the trauma bay. We've trialed this in two code, code orange simulations, and we've actually trialed this in real life so far. And we found so far that the reduction of time for blood to get to the bedside probably has gone down by about 60 to 80 percent. And with that, thank you for listening to my talk. Uh, thanks, Andrew. That's uh, really uh, great work. And, uh, and uh, there's a recent uh, paper in the Journal of Trauma that showed that delays in uh, the arrival of blood to the trauma bay is associated with higher mortality. So, so your work is obviously very important keeping around that uh, pre-thought plasma. And my question is, is that, um, you know, as I've, there's a lot of debate, especially in the whole blood community, what are safe uh, titers of anti-A, anti-B titers? And have you done any work looking at, you, you know, the average tighter of anti anti B in your in your A plasma? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so we haven't. And uh, the main reason is if we if you extrapolate from most of the trauma centers in the United States, most actually don't test for uh, the anti B titers. So we decided to sort of follow suit in that practice. Yeah, it's just a, just an interesting question because titers can vary, you know, seasonally and with immunizations and other other things. So but it's it's a great study to show that, you know, really the anti B antibody really uh, it doesn't really cause a lot of transfusion reactions within a large uh, trauma center. Congratulations. Thank you. Other question? I'm sorry, just to follow up on that question, as a Group B person, do you have any, do you have any data to say that there was no problem? Um, 
so we, um, the way we extrapolate this is actually from the other studies. So we actually had a, a genuine debate on whether or not we would collect hemolytic markers um, and uh, uh, mortality-related outcomes for this study. But to be perfectly honest, you know, the amount of patients in our study we thought would be sp so small to be sort of anecdotal compared to the rest of the literature. So if we saw one or two cases that we thought, well, may have been, uh, you may have increased hemolytic markers. Um, how does that compare to sort of the rest of the literature? We would probably believe the rest of the literature over kind of the one or two cases that we saw. And in addition, the other thing is that most of the patients that come to VGH are um, motor vehicle collisions. So we thought if we tested their haptoglobin, we might actually see hemolysis from other things, such as the trauma. Okay, great. And a second quick question, the use of AB plasma and plasmapheresis, was that for AB patients or is that used for any patients? No, so that was one uh, specific patient that was group AB that was requiring a lot of plasmapheresis. But then your ABA or whatever it's called would be okay because you were giving AB plasma to an AB patient. Yeah, and we, uh, again, we sort of debated whether or not we would um, include plasmapheresis in this, but we thought just because it skewed so much to improvement that if we benchmark this over the course of a number of years, you know, that improvement won't hold up. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. moment for the audiovisual. Our uh, second short talk this morning is being given by Anthony Shea, who is a PhD student in the laboratory of uh, Dr. Ellen Cote in our Center for Blood Research. And his talk is entitled Shorter Cell Subset Telomeres in HIV Slow Progressor Women Than in HIV Non-Slow Progressor Women. Anthony. So I think that uh, our lab is the only CBR lab that works out of the UBC hospital, so I included a nice picture for you guys here. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about HIV today, which is a virus that affects 35 million people worldwide, uh, 70,000 of whom are in Canada. The current treatment for HIV is a combination of three or four antiretroviral drugs that inhibit the HIV replication and successfully uh, increases lifespan for people who are living with HIV. But despite being successfully treated, people who live with HIV are still at an increased risk for earlier age-related diseases, uh, such as cardiovascular disease, liver disease, osteoporosis, certain cancers. And we've sort of uh, loosely termed this as the, the accelerated aging effect of HIV. But let me go into a little bit more detail uh, on how HIV infects. So HIV infects CD4 cells, but only about 1% of all CD4 cells. And 1% of all CD4 cells make up about one in a million nucleated blood cells. So what we're actually looking at is the systemic effect of these tiny amounts of uh, CD4 cells being infected with HIV. So that's activated immune system, that's chronic inflammation, that's viral proteins floating around and causing all sorts of trouble like apoptosis. So we think that all these systemic effects are what mediate systemic uh, cellular aging in the immune system. It turns out that 1% of people who live with HIV are slow progressors, meaning that they don't need antiretrovirals uh, to survive. They're able to maintain a high CD4 count and with varying degrees of success to controlling viremia, or the number of viral copies floating around in the plasma. So it's unknown whether, because these slow progressors are naturally able to uh, control HIV, whether they'd also be protected against those accelerated aging effects. So we thought that our hypothesis was that these slow progressors would, have, uh, would show you know, less severe aging um, phenotypes. So for example, the non-slow progressors would have shorter telomere length and an expanded senescent T populations. So telomere length, as most of you probably know, is a metric for the age of a cell. Uh, telomeres shorten with each cell division, so your older, more differentiated cells will have shorter telomere lengths uh, than your naive ones. And senescent just means old. Some cells don't, uh, don't undergo programmed cell death at the end of their differentiation life cycle. They just kind of float around being useless and they signal for other things. So we have a bunch of frozen PBMCs from participants um, from the HIV positive slow progressor, non-slow progressor, and HIV negative groups. We fact sort them for these four compartments, CD4, B cells, and the two types of CD8s, the old ones and the young ones. And then we measure the telomere length using qPCR within these compartments. And with the other uh, T cells, we can count the proportion of um, differentiated cells, naive central memory, effector memory, et cetera. 
Study design is pretty simple. We have a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one matching between our three groups. And just to talk a little bit about these groups, um, the non-slow progressors are all on CART and they all have undetectable viremia, which means that drug treatment is working. Um, the slow progressors are mostly off CART, so they mostly don't need drugs because they naturally control viremia um, and, uh, or the, the infection and are mostly detectable. So they're not in the millions of copies of uh, viral RNA, uh, but they are detectable. And we're comparing them with the HIV negative group. So first, let's look at telomer length, which I was just talking about. So we're looking at the comparison between the three groups that are marked by these colors here within these uh, relevant immune uh, compartments. So you can see that the CD4 uh, compartment is just uninteresting. There's just no difference between each of these three groups. Uh, and in, in the other three uh, cell subsets, there's sort of a progressive pattern. So that means we can look at um, two comparisons here. We can look at the difference between HIV negative and HIV positive, so without differentiating the non-slow and the slow progressors, and we could look at within the positive what the difference is between people who are slow progressors and not slow progressors. So in the former case, let's look at uh, the proliferative CD8 T cells on the bottom left, and you can see that the difference here is between the people who are uninfected and the people who are infected. So no difference between the slow progressors and the non-slow progressors. But the opposite is true for the B cell and senescent uh, CD8 T cell compartment, where there's not really a difference between HIV negative and the people who live with HIV but are successfully controlled by drugs. The difference is between the people who are slow progressors, not on drugs, and can apparently control HIV, um, who show lower telomer length in these two cell compartments. Now let's look at T cell differentiation. Again, we look at C4 and CD8, um, and these lines are connected lines between within participants between these three groups. So we're moving, if we move from left to right, we're going along the differentiation time scale. So we've got naive cells, central memory that differentiates into defect effector memory and terminally differentiated effector memory cells. And in C4 kind of all looks quite similar. And in, in the CD8 compartment, the most striking difference is this spike in the effector memory population in the um, slow progressor group, as you can see in the top right there. And if we look at something similar, uh, CD4 to CD8 ratio and the proliferative to senescent CD8 ratio, we, we're kind of wrapping things up and looking at um, uh, the overall gist of the thing. So HIV disease progression is marked by CD4 depletion. Looking at the top right, it doesn't matter if you're in the slow progressor or the slow progressor group, it's, your CD4 compartment is massively smaller compared to uninfected. But it's a different story if you look within the CD8s there are less um, proliferative CD8s in the slow progressor group, slightly more in the non-slow progressor group, and even more in the HIV negative group. And because we work with age, we're looking at how these markers trend with age, and you can see across all three of these that only the slow progressors, uh, progressor group show deteriorating aging markers throughout age. So decreasing telomer length in the CD8s, decreasing proliferative senescent ratio, and increasing in the last most differentiated group. So in conclusion, I mean, there's a lot of conclusions here, but basically what we're looking at is every single time we look at something within um, cellular immune aging, it's always the case that the slow progressors are worse than the non-slow progressors within the HIV positive group. So what does that mean uh, in the take home message? Contrary to what we thought, the slow progressors are actually worse at protecting against the accelerated immune effects of HIV compared to the non-slow progressors. And what this means is that we have sort of an unfettered look at what happens with HIV mediating accelerated aging if uh, the antiretrovirals weren't in inhibiting the HIV disease progression. Uh, so that's it for my talk, and I'll be happy to take questions. Hey, great talk. Uh, do you think that these patients who are slow progressors, if they were on retroviral, uh, agents CART, would that ameliorate the accelerated aging that you are seeing in these patients? I think so. I think if I, were, had, to, if I had to guess, um, the slow progressors who were treated with antiretrovirals would just look like non-slow progressors who had HIV. Uh, because the non-slow progressor group have their HIVs very, very well controlled. Their CD4s are high and their HIV is undetectable. And in fact, that's what's happening uh, in the world today. We, a few years ago, the WHO guideline recently changed. It used to be, if you could control HIV, we don't need to put you on drugs, because drugs had nasty side effects. But as time went on, the side effects of the drugs went, you know, became less and less, uh, and then we figured out more and more that if you have detectable viremia, then that's also something to worry about. 
So from now on, all the slow progressors are being treated with antiretrovirals. Mm -hmm. I, I forget what the, maybe you said this in the beginning and I missed it. I forget what the polymorphism is in the receptor for the virus to enter the cell. Right. Are your slow progressors all the ones who have the resistant polymorphism of that? That's a good question. So it tends to be that some of the slow progressors have a mutation in the CD4 co-receptor. So HRV has to bind with CD4 uh, in order to infect the cell. Um, and some pro slow progressors have uh, mutations in the co-receptor of uh, CD4 um, that that prevents HIV from binding and infecting, but not all slow progressors. I think it's about a third of um, the slow progressors have this polymorphism. And the, those that have the polymorphism are, um, are what we call elite controllers. So they're like 1% of the 1%. They can keep their CD4 high and their viral load undetectable. Given that my participants are, um, are a little bit, some of them have detectable viremia, although low, I think we have within the 35, maybe four or five uh, elite controllers. So, um, very nice talk. That. So, do you know in these slow progressing uh, HIV infected individuals, whether the spectra type, how's the TCR rearrangements? You have a very heterogeneous population of T cells compared with other populations used as a control. Uh, that's one of the major limitations of the study, which is the slow progressor group is very, very heterogeneous. So, they have different genotypes, different mutations, um, and some of them have controlled viremia, some of them don't, some of them have higher CD4, some of them don't. So we really need to continue the study to, um, to analyze more of these slow progressors so we can do sensitivity analyses within um, the specific types that you talk about. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. James Bussell, who comes to us from the medical school at Cornell in uh, New York City. And Jim is uh, very well known for uh, many decades of really interesting work in the field of, uh, of pediatric uh, immunohematology, particularly in the treatment of ITP and other uh, thrombocytopenic disorders. Uh, Jim trained at, at Yale and Columbia and then went uh, did some residency training at Cincinnati Children's, hence his snarky comment earlier about how much money Cincinnati Children's has. And, uh, and then completed fellowships at New York Hospital, a Memorial Sloan Kettering in Cornell, and has stayed in New York since that time. Uh, he's uh, very prolific in his publications and uh, all of his, co his contributions to the field were recognized um, in 2012, as he's the recipient of the King Faisal International Prize for Medicine, which is basically the, the Arab version of the Nobel. So, uh, Jim, all yours. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Drs. Conway and Devine, and Dana especially, for that nice introduction had the pleasure of knowing Dana since she was a grad student in Wendell Ross's lab. Um, I put up this slide just because it's a transfusion medicine meeting. Ben Franklin apparently had 200 ways of saying you were drunk. These were some of my selections just because they sounded funny, but I liked especially that he's drunk more than he has bled, especially in the context of what we've been talking about. So. Courtesy of Dana, I'm going to be giving two talks within this time period. One's on fetal and neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia. And I'm basically representing three of us who worked together for more than 30 years from 1983, essentially to the present. Jan McFarlane from the Blood Center of Wisconsin and Dick Berkowitz, who's now at Columbia in OBGYN. And I think everybody probably knows that this is the platelet equivalent of RH disease. And mom makes antibodies. Martha Solovisner has shown that some of these antibodies may affect megakaryocytes, which makes a lot of sense. It's hard to do neonatal marrow, so especially to get biopsies, so it's hard to really conclusively prove that. And there's also questions about whether the exposure is entirely by fetal platelets or whether there could be a contribution of GP3A on syncytiotrophoblasts that would also be very hard to prove. Um, 
One of the things that's confused the field a lot, so if anybody's really interested in FNATE, this slide and the next slide are probably the ones you should pay attention to. There's been work by the Norwegian group in Tromso that's been extremely good looking at what happens if you screen all pregnancies. Not surprising, they're describing a much milder disease than the one that those of us who follow cases clinically have recognized. So for example, it's maybe one-tenth or one-fifth as frequent as RH disease. First fetus, like with RH disease, is infrequently affected. ICH rate is very low and birth platelets are often not very low at all. Recurrence can be incomplete. Second baby may not be much or any worse affected than the first. And the current protocol in Norway, which is a very wealthy country, does routine screening of all pregnancies. Their population is about four million. Um, and they do elective cesarean section at 37 to 30 week, eight weeks in identified HPA1A um, negative moms who have antibody. So that's one way to look at it, and as you can see, it doesn't sound very serious at all. On the other hand, if you look at it the way I've worked with it, um, it's the incidence is lower. We don't really know exactly, but I think one in 5,000 to 10,000 is fair. Uh, we just submitted a manuscript about the first fetus being affected in severe cases more than 50% of the time, and thus that sensitization occurs during the first pregnancy. The ICH rate is 11 to 21%. Most of the ICHs occur in utero. Fetal platelet counts in subsequent affected pregnancies are very low, very early in gestation. And uh, almost 50% of the fetal platelet counts obtained at 20 to 24 weeks in previous studies prior to any treatment are lower than the previous sibling birth platelet count. And not surprisingly, recurrence is um, is found in essentially all of the subsequent HPA1A po effect positive fetuses of the mother. So I'm talking primarily about the clinical disease as opposed to the screening disease going forward. Um, this is the baby who um, got me interested in this. I actually never saw the baby was born in our NICU, died at 24 hours of age, platelet count at 3,000, other lab values were normal, and uh, turned out on autopsy and CT that the baby had had an intracranial hemorrhage starting at 32 weeks of gestation. The neonatologist referred the parents to me on their next pregnancy, and this gets into the, you couldn't possibly make this story up. The mother, it was 41, and this is like more than 30 years ago, so this wasn't like, oh yeah, we could do another pregnancy or save eggs or do any of the things you might do now. Um, she was already 12 weeks pregnant. They didn't know they had alloimmune. The reason they had gone back to the neonatologist to ask if this would recur is because she's a neurologist and she was attending in clinic and saw a neurology journal on the table and it described, there was an article in 1983 saying that parenchymal hemorrhages were related to alloimmune as opposed to many of you may know that intraventricular hemorrhages tend to be what occurs in um, babies with prematurity, asphyxia and things like that. So she asked him, could this be alloimmune? Her husband, by the way, is a neuroradiologist they came, we did the testing, yes, they were affected, and the question was what to do. So at the time, tried to follow the model that was then in use for subsequent pregnancies in RH-affected babies, which was to give steroids, azathioprine, and do fairly frequent phoresis. She refused azathioprine and had a very hypotensive reaction to her first phoresis. So we were left with steroids, and we, I had been working since 1981 with IVIG for ITP, thought, well, have to try this because I don't know what else I can do. 
So that's what we ended up doing. And um, I can tell you that it worked. We delivered the baby early at 32 weeks. Fetal, the platelet count of birth was 30,000. There was no hemorrhage. Baby did well. And in the part of this, you wouldn't believe it unless, if you were trying to make it up. She is now an associate professor of medieval French literature at Columbia in New York. <laughs> so, okay, so when we were managing this baby, we realized we were really flying blind. I mean, we were hoping treatment would work. We had no idea if it would. So I'm going to come back to that because that's most of what I want to tell you about. Um, in the management of the neonate, um, there's a nice study that had one Canadian of the Center of Francine de Carey and looked at the role of incompatible platelets and showed that they worked a surprisingly high percent of the time. So we currently, even though I don't know if it's the standard recommendation, give random platelets and IVIG with the idea that the random platelets might work for a day or two and the IVIG would hopefully bring up the baby's own platelets and help the disease to go away. There's a lot of antigens. I don't really have time to talk about it, all of them or even many of them, but this is PLA or HPA1, and the incompatibility of HPA1A accounts for about um, 75 or more percent of cases, especially of severe ones. Um, that polymorphism is not seen in East Asians who have polymorphisms of PEN or HPA4, and there's recently been recognition that HPA9B is another course of severe disease. This is testing where most cases the dad's a homozygote, so you know that the next baby's going to be affected. And these are all antibody tests that show that the antibody is to HPA1A, not to a negative control. The mother's serum doesn't bind to her own platelets, binds strongly to the father's platelets. The latter is very important because if this was a not routinely tested antigen, and if it was a low frequency antigen, you might not be able to find it by looking for antibody on control platelets. Suffice it to say that the only thing I ever really say about this is send your samples to the Blood Center of Wisconsin, which I know is true pro-American given that there are good centers in Canada, but within the United States, um, that's what we would recommend. What I want to tell you about is antenatal management. These were the next six babies treated after the one I showed you, and they illustrate all the important things, and this is from an article in 1988. First, you can see that Platelet counts are very low, very early in gestation. And um, the normal fetal platelet count from 20 weeks on is essentially the same as our normal count. If you don't do treatment, as you know with RH disease, the count falls, because this count was 132,000 and we didn't know what to do, so we resampled. And then with treatment, sorry, with treatment, you can see that the count went up. You see here there are three sa samples where there's two platelet counts next to each other, one circular, one square, verifying that the birth count matched the fetal platelet count. And babies five and seven also had had um, intracranial hemorrhages in their previous siblings. So we were pretty encouraged about this, but we had tried initially to use five of DEX and then three of DEX and had oligohydramnios in four of the five babies. So we thought we would do a study with one and a half milligrams of DEX to see if that would add to a gram per kilo per week of IVIG, which was an arbitrary dose we had chosen. You see here uh, that there's no difference between DEX and no DEX. Where you see some of these ones who go up after being low initially and then rise, that's the addition of prednisone um, that um, we used as a salvage arm. And you also see that the babies who were low didn't generally do as well as the babies who started at higher counts. 
So we asked if we could add prednisone and salvage, and it worked in five out of 10. And there are some reasons you could argue about why four of the other five didn't respond. So we designed a randomized protocol, and the important part is here in the high-risk arm, looking at fetuses and who had initial fetal platelet counts less than 20,000, 10 and 8,000, and there's about 20 in each group. And then we compared IVIG a gram per kilo per week to IVIG plus prednisone, a milligram per kilogram per day. And you can see that there's a dramatic and very statistically significant difference here. And also that these babies are mostly out of harm's way and these babies are not. Now the birth platelet counts weren't so different, but you can see here, I think, I, that the half the babies who got just IVIG added prednisone for having low counts, those bumps that I showed you, whereas the ones who were on IVIG and prednisone really didn't have to add anything. So the salvage arm camouflaged the difference in efficacy that you can see very clearly here. Now, it's nice to treat numbers, show that counts are better. What about treating kids with intracranial hemorrhages? It took us 11 and a half years to collect this, but it was 37 pregnancies in 33 women, all but one with HPA1A incompatibility, in whom all 33 had had a sibling suffer an ICH, the great majority of which were in utero. In the 37 treated fetuses, there were five ICHs. We were still sampling then. I think sampling is not a good thing to do, and unfortunately, we helped to demonstrate that. Um, there were two of the samplings were with fetuses, with plate, two of the hemorrhages were in fetuses who were very premature, had platelet counts greater than 100,000, but had a sampling complication. One was a, a newborn with a low count who had a grade one ICH, which could be considered relatively normal. So they're really only true major treatment failures, and we would treat them differently today. Um, if anybody cares about the details, there's an algorithm published with Dick Berkowitz and some other people um, in 2000, 11, 12, or 13 with the diagnostic part and the treatment part. Then um, here in the last study, we took the data, this was published two years ago, the, we took the data from the study about the effect of steroids and compared IVIG two per kilo per day, it's per week, excuse me, one per kilo per day twice a week to IVIG one per kilo per day plus a half a milligram of prednisone. And you see that even with this very aggressive initial therapy, and we were doing that because we wanted to treat the fetuses who would start out with very low counts, even though we didn't know who they were, you see that there is just over 10% low platelet counts at sampling at 32 weeks. So we added salvage, which was either to add a second IVIG or add the prednisone to the two IVIGs. And you can see that the birth platelet counts were greater than 50 in 11 of the 13 on salvage and only one of the six who, who didn't get salvage. So we felt you could empirically go ahead with this treatment and have outlined what it would be. Now this is the US approach. We want to treat everybody successfully, not do sampling, and still don't have a way to predict how an individual patient is doing. Other people would argue differently, and that remains to be discussed. Things that are needed are better better non-invasive means of diagnosis beyond HPA1A incompatibility and widespread availability of cell-free fetal DNA for HPA1A typing, being able to estimate severity and monitor therapy the way you can in RH disease with MCA Dopplers, um, whether there really should be screening, development of anti-HPA1A sort of innate GAM to model ROGAM, and there's possibly some other novel therapies coming along. So in 1980, you schedule the mother when she's pregnant again for a C-section 37, 38 weeks 
2018, we would provide stratified therapy depending on whether or not the previous affected sibling had had an ICH. Now, trying to do this really quickly, switching gears to talk about TPO agents, um, there may be as many as five of them. Romaplostin or Enflate and Altrombopag Promacta Revelade have both been licensed in the States since 2008 and Eltrombopag is licensed in kids, and Romaplostin will be soon. Sunshine Bio Tipo has been licensed in China and has been used for many years now. Avatrombopag and Lucitrombopag, especially Avatrombopag, may be licensed soon. Uh, there are now two good studies in ITP and a study uh, supporting the platelet count in liver biopsy. This is Romaplostin four identical peptides picked up by screening, hooked to an FC um, carrier domain. It acts at the same site as thrombopoietin does and uh, signals through a number of different receptors. This is l -trombopag. You can see it's a very small molecule compared to native thrombopoietin can be given orally but requires an empty stomach and is a chelator for calcium and iron, so it um, cannot be given anywhere close to dairy ingestion, for example. It binds to a different site, and the importance of this is that it may act differently, and I'll come briefly to a number of areas where it seems there, there's clinical data that's different from the data with romaplostin, in addition to whether or not it could be additive or synergistic with native TPO. As far as we know in platelets from a study uh, Bo Mitchell from our group published in 2014, plus or minus one, the signaling pathways are the same. This is a cartoon of precursors from stem cell going all the way to releasing platelets. I know at least one person in the audience who knows much more about this than I do. Um, but the bottom line is thrombopoietin drives the whole thing, but it drives making megas, and it's generally not believed that it drives making platelets. People who are working on in vitro platelet production um, take out TPO and add other constituents once they have incubated long enough to get lots of megas. What exactly it is that drives the last step remains under investigation. There's a lot of new work about various things. Karen Hoffmeister, who Dr. Cancellus mentioned in her talk, showed that you can stimulate thrombopoietin with desiolated um, glycoprotein receptors on platelets, and it shares a pathway with the IL-6 receptor to stimulate production of TPO. It's likely that that's a minor pathway, but that's not um, absolutely clear yet. There's controversy in the field as to whether megakaryocyte apoptosis is required for platelet production. I would say the evidence is against that, but again, I'm not an expert in this area. And finally, there's some work with l that suggests it's intracellular iron chelation maybe a TPO independent way to increase the platelet count, but again, I think if that's true, that's a minor pathway as well. ITP we know is a B-cell disease, though not everybody's uh, plasma from patients with ITP dropped recipient normal platelet counts, did inhibit megakaryocytes from a couple of different studies showing that ITP is a disease of reduced platelet production as well as destruction. Immunology of ITP is enough to baffle anyone, and almost all the steps you see in this cartoon have been targeted with variable effects. I will say the biggest lesion in ITP right now is not the absence of a wonderful treatment, it's the absence of being able to discriminate who to treat with what. For example, if you had a patient with leukemia, you would do a whole bunch of studies, divide into 20 or more groups, and then target your therapy according to that patient's leukemia. We don't do that with ITP. They get ITP and we treat them. And the most targeting we do is to see who responds to what. So I'm going to have to leave that aside. 
and I'm just going to talk to you about what you could expect if you use the TPO agent. This is from the very first study published back in 2006. You can see there's a dose response here and that not everybody responds as we talked about. Um, looking at, this is avatrombopag and ltrombopag, you see that responders have bigger increases in their absolute platelet retic counts than patients who responded to anti-D or IVIG, who also had very nice platelet increases, demonstrating that this is really a unique way that this works. Taking over from IVIG, this is the best study treatment of ITP. In red are five of the largest randomized placebo-controlled trials in ITP, and in, these are all in adults, and these are the long-term manuscripts looking at side effects. These are the pediatric studies and the um, randomized study with romaplastin and petite and petite 2 are three of the largest randomized studies. So in general, these agents are on solid ground for efficacy, I would point out to you that all those studies are placebo controlled and not compared to any other therapy and that's kind of been the big lesion in the field in addition to what I mentioned about diagnosis. I think thrombosis of one type or another is the most important side effect you see. Um, there's been concern in MDS, at least in high grade MDS, that you can stimulate leukemic cells questions with l trombopag as to whether there should be routine monitoring for cataracts. About 3% of patients, children and adults, don't tolerate l trombopag because of abnormal liver tests. Romaplastin especially can lead to the platelet count coming up and down. Not clear on alloantibody formation, never shown to cross-react with native TPO, but may occur in up to 1% of patients and marrow reticulin, which we used to worry about fibrosis and scarring, has not been an important issue as more and more studies, including our own, have shown. These are the two pediatric studies, different endpoints, but very significant findings. One thing illustrated here, looking at one count, 62% response rate, looking at a more durable response, 40% response rate. So depending on what you want, like if you want your patient to have a platelet count of greater than 50,000 all the time, child or adult, you're only talking 40 to 50 percent, which is why on this slide I put a very wide range of rate of response. Should take about a week for the count to come up. Weirdly, there's data, there's a very nice Italian study from Cantoni a couple of years ago that if, some, if you want to treat somebody with let's say romaplastin or l trombopag and it doesn't work, you can change to the other agent and it'll work most of the time. I totally don't get it, but it speaks to the issue of the different binding sites. How many patients will improve and be, quote, cured after time on treatment? Also not very clear. And because of their unique mechanism effect, as I showed you, the, this is a really great part of combination therapy if you need it. So really good agents, generally pretty safe, um, not clear if they have any uh, curative effects. Now you may know that they've been licensed for severe aplastic anemia in combination with immunosuppressive therapy, the theory being that the immunosuppressive therapy has eliminated the attacks on the marrow, but you may have a very limited reservoir of stem cells and need to stimulate it. And this is from the original study, but showed the surprise that it could be a trilineage effect. And here you see marrows and three responders becoming much more cellular and one non-responder not. The data suggests that the induction of leukemia is probably not more than would happen anyway. And it's a very good therapy and now studies are ongoing to use it up front. With the first generation TPO agents, since this is a blood bank meeting, just showing you that there was a terrific increase in platelet yield, this, the formation of antibodies and resulting normal donors having very pro profound and persistent thrombocytopenia, 
is why it hasn't been used in this area, but I'm beginning to wonder why the newer agents are not and when they should be used, because they would clearly increase the yield a lot. I think the most exciting new stuff is in chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia, which is kind of why these agents were developed in the first place. They don't work in myeloablative chemotherapy, so for example in AML, when you'd really want them to work, they don't work. But what about solid tumors? This study was published years ago and was with one of the first generation agents. And what happened is they did the study, published an abstract, and then when it went out of use because of those antibodies, they gave up on, um, sorry, they gave up on following up on the study. But when the newer agents came out, they followed up. And this is the study that shows a unique benefit of survival in patients who received um, chemotherapy and a TPO agent. You see here on-time therapy was much better than delayed and the survival was very effective. This was in relapsed lymphoma using ice chemotherapy. So this is again what you would be shooting for. Jerry Soffit Memorial has been doing a study, he published a pilot a couple of years ago and now has 40 patients in a randomized trial. What's really striking here is the orange squares are giving romaplastin. So the idea is, unlike how we use GCSF, where you give the chemo and then you start GCSF the day after chemo, this is continuous use of romaplastin, and the green bars are the chemo. So you can see it's being given irrespective of when chemo is being given. And this was confirmed by a recent study that I think is about to come out from China where they had three different regimens using high-dose ARAC and they randomized 55 patients between getting the Sunshine Biologics TIPO, which somewhat resembles native thrombopoietin, on day minus four and minus two and then for nine days after chemo versus giving the TIPO for 11 days after chemo. So they had better platelet recovery, avoidance of severe thrombocytopenia, and evidence of more on-time chemo, but no other study except for the one I showed you has yet demonstrated a survival benefit. And I don't know if there's any reason to think there should be stem cell exhaustion, but there's no data on that. So this is the last slide. Um, no question that thrombopoietic agents are very useful in children and adults with ITP. Was licensed at least in the U.S. for hepatitis C, but as treatment has improved, um, it's been much less used in that area. I believe studies have given up on MDS, even though it may be useful in low IPSS score MDS. There's two studies in congenital thrombocytopenia Carlo Baldwini with MYH9 and us with Wiscott Aldrich um, that suggests it could be effective there. I showed you data for platelet donation. Bone marrow aplasia it's licensed for, acquired aplastic anemia. I think people are hopefully going to figure out how to use it in solid tumor chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia. And there's amazingly little data in the transplant field for reasons that befuddle me. Thanks very much. Sorry if I ran a little over. Thank you for the talk. I, I had, hopefully, I can, can I ask two questions? So, um, the, the first one is the use of TPO agonists in aplastic anemia. And we know they have some effects, say, on DNA repair pathways. Do you think using them in that disease has sort of shed light on new mechanisms for aplastic anemia? You know, traditionally we thought the immune mediated, but because of some of the other effects, is it sort of revealing other pathophysiologies? And, and my second question was the screening. Do you believe that we should be routinely screening for platelet antibodies? Okay, let me take a shot at the first question first. Um, there is at least one study suggesting that TPO agents help with non-homologous end joining. I think that's what you're referring to. The DNA. Yeah. yeah. And um, 
I don't really know whether that's an important part of this. I think um, I would hope it would be brilliant if somebody like Alan DeAndrea or somebody like that would take this to heart and really study it. But I really think we just don't know. But there's a lot of tip of the iceberg stuff for areas where this has been in wide use for a number of years and been, quote, well studied, unquote. As far as screening, I think it's a really complex question. If you could buy that screening and just doing an elective C-section at 37 to 38 weeks was enough, then that's probably okay. Um, if you're screening, though, what you'd like to do is develop prophylaxis. So the company Prophylix Pharma that's an, out, an offshoot of the group in Tromso was working on it and has done a number of the initial steps, but it, my best understanding is they ran out of funding and can't really go forward and they can't convince any of the bigger biologics who have the bucks to really take it and run with it. So, but I think it would be pretty complicated because only about one out of 10 HP at, at most, HPA 1B, 1B women would actually have a kid affected with alloimmune. So you'd have to screen, and then you'd want to screen for antibody, then you'd want to screen for DRB3-0101, um, because well over 90% of the women with, who are HPA1B and become sensitized um, do it in the context of that immunogenetic um, antigen. So it's a lot of testing to do, and even then it's not everybody, you know, do you just prophylax everybody? Um, the only good thing I can say is that they had a meeting with the FDA, and the FDA was incredibly positive and very encouraging. So I would like to see it happen, but I'd like to see it happen that way with the disease prevention thing, not so much with just the cesarean section and you know, hopefully the first kid will do okay. And as, as we said, in our study of the severely affected babies, um, they're often affected in the first pregnancy. 71% of the ones who went on to have an ICH were first kids of the mother. So I'm not sure where we stand. And I think all those complicated issues are why it's not so clear. Because of that, I apologize for such a long answer. Because of that, I'm not sure how the economics of it would work out, and therefore, would it be feasible or not? But I think it's a really important point, so I appreciate your letting me emphasize it. Sorry, a quick question. Why are they so keen on cesarean sections in Norway, given the population sample they've got? Is that a routine, is, is, is it really a routine practice for cesarean section at 38 weeks for everybody? Um, let me see. Let me try rephrasing the question and see if I have the right idea. Are you asking, is it worth doing a cesarean section to prevent hemorrhage in those patients? Yes. Okay. Um, so first off, any studies that have looked at this have not demonstrated it. And there was a review by Cook 15 or more years ago saying, hey, it didn't matter. I think in alloimmune it didn't matter because in most of the severe cases, as I think I showed you, a great majority occur in utero, so doing a cesarean section is not going to do anything. So we have always espoused in affected babies doing a cesarean section because especially if you do it not in labor, potentially it's safer, but there is really no data on it. I think the reason they do it is Otherwise, they would have to rupture membranes and go through induction at 37 to 38 weeks. And even though I have a secondary OB appointment, I'm not a card-carrying obstetrician, and I believe there would be some difficulties with that if the woman was not ready to deliver. So I think that's why they're doing that. Thanks very much, Jim. So just give us one brief moment while we load up some slides. The AV assistant will work his miracles. So he paid the big bucks. That's why he gets the big bucks, that's right. So our next speaker 
is uh, Professor Peter Zanstra from UBC. It feels really good to say that, I'm not yeah. say from U of T. And uh, welcome back, Peter. Uh, Peter was uh, originally trained uh, here, here at UBC, did his PhD um, under the supervision of Jamie Perrett and Connie Eaves, who are well known to, to all of us in the CBR. Uh, he then went off to continue his training at, uh, at MIT, eventually landing at uh, the University of Toronto, where he's had a very successful career um, in really running the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering there. And then, uh, fortunately, we were able to lure him back to the West Coast. I think uh, it just eventually we all, we all congregate back here. And uh, Peter's now, uh, as of last year, come back here to UBC as the founding director of the School of Biomedical Engineering, which has just launched, for those of you who weren't aware of it. And he's also the director of the Michael Smith Laboratories. So in all of these roles, he's having a big impact on campus, but I think he's really here today to talk to us about uh, work in engineering blood development. Peter. Uh, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I just saw Christian Castro up in the audience. He's going to recognize these slides from yesterday. But <laughs> um, uh, and, and actually, I'm really excited to uh, start to interact with the CBR because I think there's really great opportunities between some of the stuff my lab does and some of the opportunities we have. So um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to go through a, a tight series of studies that we've recently published in the last little while that really uh, examine the question about the use of uh, uh, expanded blood stem cells derived from the local core blood as a therapeutic for AML. And um, I'm happy to talk in the question and answer period about <coughs> where the field is going with blood stem cell transplantation. I know there's the, the, the use of core blood has, has both waxed and waned and, and been increasing in various er areas. And I think we've identified a number of situations where core blood transplantation, expanded core blood transplantation really has very significant advantages that are worth looking at carefully. So of course the problem is very simple. Um, we want to have access to well-matched, uh, robust uh, cells with the right composition. And, and so what I'll pitch today is that the ideal graft is really a, a multifaceted component. And if I could ask if there's a pointer. Um, Okay, I'll try to, okay. So, um, and that includes uh, really uh, at least three components, three which I'll talk about today. You need enough blood stem cells to have confidence. You have, you're gonna have long-term graft uh, stability. Um, it needs to be matched at some level. And we think that there's big advantages to having the right T-cell components in there. And of course the T-cell components in themselves are complex, they involve they affect both the GVHD aspects, the GVH, GVL aspects, grass versus leukemia aspects, as well as the repopulation rates and, and, and uh, compositions of different populations. So the starting point in this is really the question is, is you know, blood stem cells were first uh, carefully characterized in Canada uh, more than 60 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, by Jim Till and Nurse McCulloch, and, and yet it's been really hard to figure out how to grow these cells well. And I think perhaps this is not surprising because we now understand that there's a really a continuum of cells between the stem cell and the differentiated progeny, and the opportunity, their ability to hit just a single cell population is very difficult, and often we also hit other cell populations when we add growth factors or small molecules or cytokines, and this results in the production of more mature cells at the same time as getting stem cell proliferation. And then very quickly in these cultures, you initiate feedback loops. These feedback loops then affect the dynamics of the system and the outcome of the blood stem cells in these systems. So we recognize that early on and, 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 and essentially developed a, uh, a band-aid engineering solution to overcome this problem. And that's shown on this plot here. Basically what we did was we started to understand the rate of secretion of these negative factors and simply added media to the cultures in a continuous way that matched that rate of secretion or the average rate of secretion that one would expect across a number of different cultures. And, and here you can see that you have much lower levels of all these negative factors and this results in better, uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk about CD34 positive cell growth, but of course we all recognize there are many different markers for uh, 
primitive blood stem cells as well as in vivo assays that go along with uh, this data. Um, so, uh, so that's an initial improvement. Um, that really opened up the question as to whether we could understand the communication networks that uh, are behind hematopoiesis a little bit better. And this is a complicated slide that captures a, a lot of work from Dan Kerouac and Wendy Clow. But basically what it says is that there is these communication networks that feed back to the blood stem cell. These occur either through endogenously secreted factors, autocrine loops, or paracrine loops from the progenitor cells or different mature cells, including megakaryocytes and different neutrophils or myeloid type cells. And the language of this communication network is really what we started to learn. What are the specific molecules? Who is secreting what? What is the direction of this interaction? And what is the effect of this direction on proliferation, differentiation, uh, and other types of effects? And this allowed us then to go back to these culture technologies and provide much more intelligent or personalized control in this manner. And so this, this slide really reviews that, where now we can take our feedback network and we can weight it according to the reality of the specific situation. How many receptors are expressed on different cells within the hematopoietic compartment? What are the relative numbers of different blood cells, myeloid, lymphoid, and other cell types to provide a weighting for that? And importantly, what is the compartmentalization of the stem cell component within the marrow that allows access of certain subpopulations to feed back upon blood stem cells and others not? We've taken this information, we've integrated it into a controlled uh, bioreactor system that has sensors on it. Those sensors measure the secretion of different cell types along the way and what they secrete. That allows us to use uh, simple mathematical models. In this case, I'm showing some data from a proportional integral derivative control system, which allows us to control blood stem cell growth um, significantly better than just using our simple algorithm. What's important is this also allows us to personalize this. So as one moves from one donor sample to the next, the system is adjusted, much like in our bodies, to the conditions of that specific culture. What is the growth rate? What is the composition of the different cell populations there? So it's really a personalized bioreactor system. <laughs> so that's one problem. Now, uh, the, at the same time, um, for many years, I've been working with a close collaborator, Guy Sauvigeau, at the University of Montreal and their Institute for Cancer Therapy. And Guy was really after, you know, is, are there small molecules? <coughs> Excuse my coughing. Are there small molecules that specifically target the blood stem cell to change the rates of differentiation in the production of these different cell types? Working with Anne Marinier and the PhD student Iman Fares, they identified in a screen uh, targeted at CD34 positive 45 RA negative cells a molecule which was called UM729 uh, and being a chemist eventually modified this molecule and, and we now call it UM171 and we now know that when you combine this molecule with uh, um, the, the bioreactor system we can get uh, remarkable blood stem cell growth really that is able to continue for a fairly long period of time <coughs> really by balancing both the rates of differentiation and then the negative effects of the cells that we do generate. So <coughs> um, this has uh, been a really fun journey for us. Uh, we launched a, a new Canadian company using blood stem cell expansion and testing its efficacy as a therapy. Of course, I'm a co-founder of this company, and thus you have to recognize that my comments should be taken in that light. Um, uh, but it, I like the idea behind this because it really combines a bioreactor and a small molecule therapeutic. And what I'm happy to talk about today is, is some of the early clinical data that has come out of testing now about 25 patients uh, in the use of expanded cord blood uh, for this purpose. This is a, led by a PI in Montreal, Sandra Cohen, and a team at the Hospital maison de um, And really, this is a, a phase one, two trial looking at feasibility, safety, hematopoietic reconstitution, 
and importantly, and a great advantage really of working uh, um, uh, in these systems with Health Canada, uh, an adaptive clinical trial protocol where we've been able to change the uh, um, uh, rules by which we access cord blood or transplant the system as we meet certain milestones along the way. And I think this is a very exciting development for clinical studies. So um, uh, this is an important slide in terms of the patient characteristics. Most are uh, uh, CR1 AML, a couple of CR2, uh, some uh, non-hydrogen non leukoma, and a few a scattering of other diseases. Um, median age 45. Um, you can see that in the, uh, we had about a net clinical 34 expansion uh, of CD34 positive cells and a number of other uh, metrics associated with the manufacturing outcomes in this system. And so, um, you know, I won't go through in detail all the clinical outcomes, and I'll, but I'll review them on the next slide. But I wanted to go to this point that what we, when we started the trial, we did a double cord blood transplant. And we did that for the first three patients, and our gating strategy was that if we could show that the, that the expanded cord dominated the patient after transplant, we could move on to single cords. We did that. We then moved on to single cords that were very large, that met many of the criteria in terms of size uh, that had. But of course, this is always a compromise for the clinician. Very large cords have a lower probability of HLA matching. And as we get better, more and more confidence in the expansion, we're able to move through three different cohorts that start to access smaller and smaller cords, which allow us better and better HLA matching. And you can see here that um, one of the outcomes for this trial, this is, a, this is data from 19 patients, uh, we've, uh, is that on average we're improving the HLA match of the expanded sample versus the unexpanded sample. Other outcomes from the trial, we've shown it's a clinically viable protocol. We have, um, uh, we have uh, we've designed it so the expansion occurs within the duration of the conditioning machine uh, regime. This has a, a number of important advantages in terms of cost drivers. Uh, we use small volume cultures that are quite low cost relative to many of other people out there. Um, we see a, a decreased transplant related mortality and significantly decreased hospitalization length. Um, we, we're seeing, and we're seeing clinical benefits that are, seem to be beyond what one would expect if one just had a really big cord blood that was about the size of what we expanded and we're starting to understand why this may be by looking deep, more deeply at the different subpopulations which are produced in this expansion system. So I did, I did want to make a comment that it's, it's quite exciting as a bioengineer that, you know, we published the papers behind this in 2013 and 14, and now we're in 2018, about four years later, and we finished a phase one clinical trial. And I really think that just shows some of the opportunities in the area of these cellular therapeutics where you can move quickly into small trials where you can get a significant amount of information. So um, I'm rushing through this a little bit because I want to tell two other pieces of this story. Um, and, and this is now thinking about what else we can do. Now that we can grow blood stem cells with increasing confidence, one can start to think of the different cell types which one can produce out of blood stem cells and how they might uh, influence the composition of the transplant. And I'll focus now on the production of T cells, specifically progenitor T cells. <coughs> now, progenitor T cells in themselves may be useful to treat lymphopenias that often happen post-transplant. But of course, there's all other motivations. Um, uh, T cells themselves are an exciting area for cancer immunotherapies. Um, but there are also limitations to some of the more mature T-cell uh, patient-derived samples that are being used. They're, they're highly variable cell products. Their, uh, their proliferation in vivo uh, um, may, be, um, may be somewhat limited in some cases. Um, and, I, and, and of course, we all know that there are different types of T-cells, each of which may play a role in both uh, managing uh, um, uh, the effectiveness of the immunotherapeutic. And so we think that by, by producing engineered progenitor T cells, ideally from stem cells, that we may be able to have a different sort of product that might have certain advantages. So how do you do this? And, and of course, our goal here was to engineer the microenvironment that mimicked the thymus in order to deliver the right signals to the blood stem cells to undergo in vitro T cell development. This was a, has been a really fun collaboration with Juan Carlos Zuniga Fluker, a developmental immunologist at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. <coughs> and our goal was really to understand the minimum cues for progenitor T cell differentiation from blood stem cells 
and then transplant these cues into materials that could be injected in vivo to mimic the thymic niche. <coughs> As you may know, um, there is a, 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 a culture technology capable of inducing T cell development from blood stem cells. <coughs> Thank you. And this is the OP9 DL4 cell line. This cell line um, expresses uh, DL4 on its surface and is able to induce the notch ligand uh, and, and undergo notch signaling to result in T cell differentiation. One problem with the system is that we, if we just provide notch ligand, this isn't effective. And we don't really understand what the cell line is doing specifically. Are there other factors? Are there matrix proteins there? And of course, the cell line is not ideal for clinical purposes. So um, uh, Shreya Sukla, Matthew Langley, and John Edgar, three students in my lab, in a project led by Shreya, um, started to investigate what the minimal signals would be that could replace this OP9 system. Um, they eventually identified VCAN as an important partner of DLL4 that for human cells gives you very significant T cell differentiation from blood stem cells. You can see here DLL4 alone on these surfaces. You get no progenitor T cells. With DLL4 VCAN, you get a nice robust T cell development. Furthermore, Shreya discovered what the mechanism behind this process is. She showed that, in fact, what's happening here is that when you put T cells on VCAM coated surfaces, this induces the migration effect of these cells. Through that migration effect, you have a consequent pulling on the surface of the notch ligand, which activates more robustly that receptor system. And you can see here, if you look at the gene expression associated with T cell development, you have a, a significant upregulation of genes only on the DLL4 VCAM surface and not on any other surfaces. We also have looked in vivo at the transplantation of this progenitor T cells. They function very much like uh, progenitor T cells should function in terms of their more mature, their ability to mature into CD3 positive and other cell types, secrete IL2 and other factors. And in data I don't have time to talk about today, we're interested in moving this technology into hydrogels and using that transplanted in vitro. So for the final part of my talk, I'd like to talk about the, the, the last component of how we're engineering the ideal graft. And, and this really talks about how we want to start to understand the uh, immune interactions that occur upon transplantation and the relationship between the components which are transplanted, the patient itself, and the cell types which are transplanted. And, and this is really built on the observation that everybody more or less has their own recipe. You know, you, uh, and, and often that recipe is not controlled. We want to transplant blood stem cells, but we want early plate reconstitution, we want lymphopoiesis, we want this all to occur rapidly enough that the patient doesn't have to, uh, is not uh, subjective to opportunistic infections, but also we want to make sure that there's no feedback interactions between these cells and the blood stem cells. And so um, what Wei Jia Wang did um, is an interesting study that led us down this route. And it's perhaps a bit small for this room, but uh, what Weija did is took a, a humanized mouse model, transplanted either unselected umbilical cord blood or different, uh, or CD34 positive umbilical cord blood or different amounts of unselected cord blood, um, either with equivalent more or less numbers of CD34 positive cells. And what she found unexpectedly is the more uh, cells you put into these mice, even if you exceeded the number of CD34 positive cells that were in the selected sample, the worse you got at uh, stem cell reconstitution over short-term transplants. So what's going on here? As I showed you before, we had this nice feedback system where we started to understand the communication networks within the blood stem cell system, and we had good clues as to what might be the negative regulators of blood stem cell survival that would be secreted from within the graft itself. Um, we, we did a, a screening study to identify these candidates, and we focused specifically on TNF-alpha. TNF-alpha has a significant negative effect on blood stem cell growth um, um, and, and uh, um, was a good candidate for looking at what might be going on in the system. Here you can show we can reproduce that in in vitro cultures. 
uh, in the absence of TNF-alpha, the cells grow well. If we add TNF-alpha, they grow very poorly. If we add blocking antibodies against TNF-alpha R1 specifically, we're able to recover that cell growth. And if we add Entracept, which is a TNF-alpha decoy receptor, which is clinically used, we can also uh, recover that blood stem cell growth. We wanted to ensure that we knew which cell type in the transplant would be responsible for this endogenous uh, negative feedback loop. We used a, a technology called Cytoff, which is basically a mass cytometry at the single cell levels, analysis of five intracellular proteins, 23 cell surface markers, and we did this dynamically in cells derived in vivo and saw that the, the emergence of, of, of these uh, memory T cells were a major source of TNF-alpha. This is TNF-alpha signal, red being high, uh, specifically in the CD4 positive, C38 negative, HLA DR positive subpopulation of these cells. This, this allowed us to then ask if we, uh, understanding the timing in which this cell population was emerging, could we rescue the effects of these unselected cord blood samples? Uh, this is the 34 positive control. This is blood stem cells when treated with Entracept, the, uh, the clinically relevant uh, uh, TNF-alpha blocking agent or decoy receptor. These are blood stem cell numbers. They're equivalent in both cases. So that was step one. We were able to show that one could now transplant unselected cord blood into these mice and get good uh, CD34 positive reconstitution. What was a big advantage and surprise we found is that we were able to retain the positive factors of having all these mature cells also transplanted. And, and you can see that here in the conditions that had unselected core blood plus entracept, we had much more rapid myeloid and megakaryocyte reconstitution. Uh, we also looked at many other lineages in this paper to really show that there was significant advantages to both survival of the blood stem cells and rapid reconstitution of the mature cell types. We also showed in data I'm not showing today that TNF-alpha was an important initiator in this cascade and that many of the other negative factors which were upregulated in MIP1-alpha, IL-1, uh, and others uh, were, were regulated first by activation of TNF-alpha, which we could block with Entracept. So the model is basically shown here. Uh, if you transplant these cells, there's endogenous T cells that at least in part attack the stem cells. But if you add a blocking agent, you can rescue this. You get more stem cells, but you also get more rapid reconstitution. <coughs> so we're really excited about this area. We're excited because we can now uh, grow blood stem cells in a very coordinated manner that gets rid of the, much of the variability between donor samples. <coughs> We can start to manipulate the composition of these graphs by getting those blood stem cells to differentiate into different blood cell types. And we're starting to understand the role of those different blood stem cells in the success and function post-transplant. Of course, the ultimate goal is to understand how to uh, uh, reduce even further any conditioning which is required in patient transplants. And of course, that would open up all kinds of new opportunities for blood stem cell transplant in other autoimmune diseases, in infectious disease, and in non-malignant uses of blood stem cell transplant. So um, uh, this work was done at the University of Toronto when I was there, has been a very uh, wonderful partnership with my lab. Uh, I've mentioned the leaders along the way which helped with this work. It, it was a nice collaboration with CCRM, the Center for Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine, uh, that along with IRACOR helped to accelerate this work. Um, and the work was done in the Donnelly Center at the University of Toronto. I've went I'm very thankful for funding specifically for this work from CIHR, uh, from the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and from the Stem Cell Network. Um, of course, I'm happy to be here now. Uh, I'm really excited at the opportunities that are before us uh, uh, by building new collaborations and further bringing forward some of these technologies. Happy to take questions. So I'm interested in something about how long these, uh, uh, the cord blood extracts can actually last because you've done a great job of communicating how we can take these cord blood extracts and kind of HLA match them and mold them into the population that we want. 
But one of my questions is, how long does that actually last? Because if you get one cord blood to extract and it has to be used within two months, or else your window of opportunity is over, then that limits the opportunity of, say, creating a bank of cord blood extracts that could be used almost on, and grown potentially in an indefinite basis to treat almost any leukemia. Yeah, so, so just to be clear, we're working with um, cord blood cells that have been expanded in, in certain ways. Um, and we, um, in terms of how long the unmanipulated cord can be stored for, um, you know, Dana would know better than I, but I think that's been, you know, they've been around for many years, let's say 15 years, if not more, and, and still occasionally are used. Uh, I don't see that to be a problem. Uh, what we're working on right now is, is because our culture, we really worked very hard to keep our culture system lower than seven days so they could be really close to the conditioning period required currently. We want to bring that down further. If we can bring that fully in vivo, that's great. Um, and, uh, um, and then also work towards a cryopreserved sample so that we can expand and then really use anywhere in a st stable way. So those are all things we're looking at. Your data on the anti-TNF-alpha with the tanner septa are very provocative. Uh, so did you compare whether ex vivo versus in vivo treatment with anti-TNF-alpha was making a big difference? Because now there are very nice data published recently in Nature Medicine showing that anti-TNF-alpha really has an effect on the microenvironment through bone marrow endothelial cells and vascular regeneration. So did you see a difference or did you try or did you look at whether to use anti-TNF-alpha ex vivo versus in vivo really make a difference in the engraftment potential of the cells? Yeah, so, so we, did, we, we tested in the blocking in vitro, and it had this positive effect on blood stem cell growth. And then we followed that on up by in vivo yeah. dosing at specific doses. And what, what, we, what our challenge was, um, was <coughs> excuse me, to figure out the best timing. Because we think that you, you want to have um, early take of the cells, but then just as T cells are coming up, you want to be able to allow those cells to proliferate before getting feedback signals from those T cells. But of course, there's a graft versus leukemia phase, which a graft versus host effect that occurs later on, which is sometimes managed by IL-6, uh, anti-IL-6 uh, factors. And we think there's a window there where TNF-alpha could make a big difference. Uh, we're discussing with various groups now the possibility of testing that clinically, but we haven't done so yet. Uh, and just a small question, if I may. Uh, did you try in your clinical trials for core blood expansion, yeah. whether yeah. instead of using core blood, yeah. to this apply to gene therapy trials? Because the major problem we have clinically today yeah. is not core blood transplant. Yeah. It's gene therapy trials, yeah. hemoglobinopathies and other diseases where we don't have enough cells yeah. to get a good chimera. Do you think of doing those trials? Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's where we're going. We wanted to show you know, I, I understand. a foundation for that. And and so we're very excited to work with that, and, and I'm happy to, you know, could pursue opportunities for collaborative interactions in that area. Thanks. Other questions? Oh. <coughs> Thank you for the talk. I, I, it was around a similar kind of question, because the timing of TNF therapy post-transplant can be a bit tricky. So, so my question is, have you been able to, to take that that knowledge and expand it to, say, patients who failed engraftment or have delayed engraftment? Is there any evidence that similar mechanisms are at play in some of these patients that are, you know, and is that? Yeah, so funnily enough, there are some kind of case studies that look really interesting because, of course, antiseps used for other things, and, and so there's no formal studies that I'm aware of, but, um, but reading between the lines, as one tends to do in this, in this area sometimes, or needs to do in this area sometimes, um, we think there's a, there's a window that will be promising, but we, we just hasn't been tested yet. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, we're now moving into that part of our program where we're going to do some shotgun talks, and, and the master of ceremonies who is in charge of shotgun talks will happily 
uh, coordinate all of that. Okay, I don't have to do much coordination. Everybody who's giving a short, um, those shotgun talks for posters, you line up at the front of the stage, please. You guys know the route. Right, you can line up on the, why don't you line up on the stage? And then as you... You can tell that. Now you don't think of the What's the name of the... That's good. Productive Science Communication. How's that? 30 second presentation. Is that Beverly's going to make an announcement also? Hi there. Um, my name is Beverly Bicare, and I'm a PhD candidate uh, at the uh, Robert Hancock Lab. Uh, I just wanted to remind you, or uh, to, to let you guys know, that there is an event two weeks from now on the 26th. Uh, for effective uh, science communications, uh, and we have a couple of flyers uh, at the end uh, to hand out to you if you're interested in joining us. Um, so, the focus of my research is uh, cellular reprogramming and endotoxin tolerance, or the inability to respond to uh, stimulus observed in sepsis patients. Sepsis is a dysregulated host immune response that, uh, to infection that has been linked to, to monocytes. Therefore, my hypothesis is that reprogrammed um, induced pluripotent stem cell-derived macrophages, or monocytes, are able to drive this dysregulated uh, host response. So we found that when we replicate endotoxin tolerance or cellular reprogramming in vitro, we observe our gene signature. This is important since our gene signature could help determine whether a patient will go on to develop sepsis. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Arjun. Um, I'm in the Bob Hancock lab also. I'm doing a master's degree in bioinformatics. So I currently use machine learning algorithms to analyze the gene expression profiles of septic patients. So my ultimate goal is to one, characterize uh, gene expression endotypes, and two, uh, determine if patients with infection actually do pr go, on to, go on to sepsis or not. Thank you. And I do have a poster, but I forgot the number, so you can find me there. Thanks. Hi, my name is Lily Takeuchi. I am a master's student in Jay Kazakadathu's lab. And so generally, low, small molecules are associated with low solubility as well as rapid clearance. However, when conjugated to polymers, these can alter their physiochemical properties for a more favorable pharmacokinetic profile. And so in our work, we've synthesized and characterized ultra-high molecular weight hyperbranched polyglycerols. And study the cell compatibility as well as their circulation. So if you want to learn more about how their properties can be exploited for use in therapeutics delivery, uh, find my poster at poster number 13. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Vince Sanini. I work in Dr. Hugh Kim's laboratory. My research looks at the relationship between chronic peritoneal disease and thrombosis. So chronic peritoneal disease is a severe gum infection and it has systemic effects, um, most notably thrombosis. To measure this, we, looked, uh, we used rotational thromboelastometry, and we compared patients at the Faculty of Dentistry that had severe gum infection with age-matched and healthy controls. What we found was that the, uh, the blood clot dynamics, uh, the, the blood clots were forming earlier, and to, to kind of expand on that phenomenon, we then did uh, cell uh, platelet spreading assays, and we found that the filopodia formation is actually occurring also uh, more extensively and earlier on. So if you're interested in this paper, come see me at uh, poster three. Hi everyone, my name is Umeya Mara. I'm working as a postdoctoral researcher fellow in Dr. Kim lab. In Kim, Kim lab, I'm trying to work to define the undefined mechanism between um, uh, periodontitis and thrombosis. Periodontitis is a gram-negative infection that affects half of the North American populations. It is a systemic disease uh, which also includes thrombosis. So uh, I'm trying to find the links, direct communications between, between periodontitis and thrombosis. The, um, um, the, um, as Vince has told, that uh, in periodontitis patients, there is a reduced clotting time. And he also uh, did uh, found the um, platelet spreading assay, um, by platelet spreading assay, more filopodia formations. The filopodia formations is architectured um, by um, um, polymerization of actin. CDC42 
activation act as a switch for actin poly polymerization. So we found that uh, CDC42 activations increased um, in purified uh, platelets in presence of P's intervalous LPS. However, when we used um, CDC42 inhibitor, uh, this uh, um, P's intervalous LPS induced activation of CDC42 uh, was attenuated dose dependently. If you more, uh, want more uh, know about it, come to poster number three. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anthony Shea, and I work in Ellen Cote's lab. Um, I was given 10 minutes earlier this morning, so it seems selfish to take another 30 seconds. I'll be really fast. Um, HIV is associated with accelerated immune aging, and we don't really have an opportunity to study how that works in people who are not undergoing uh, antiretroviral therapy, which controls HIV replication. So we have a pretty special cohort of slow progressors that aren't on antiretrovirals. And if you're interested in how that works, uh, then come find me on poster 17. Hello, my name's Adam Ziada. I'm also from Alain Cote's lab. And both Alain and um, Anthony have been coaching me to make this uh, shotgun very engaging for you guys. And I'm still trying to figure out what my main story is. But has anyone had a common cold? What if a virus could make you lose 10 years off your life? What if, perhaps smoking, doesn't cause oxidative damage, but maybe causes you to have accelerated aging in different ways. What if there was a poster, poster number 14, <laughs> that potentially had answers to these kinds of questions? I don't know, but my name is Adam, and I am at poster number 14. Hi, I'm Angela from the Carson Lab. I'm studying del 5 tmds which is a type of blood cancer where patients become anemic and dependent on red blood cell transfusions. Um, if left untreated, it can progress to bone marrow failure. But the only effective drug right now, lenalidomide, allows for transfusion independence in most patients, but about half the patients relapse within two to three years. So our goal is to identify mechanisms of lenalidomide action and uh, resistance based on patient sequencing data. And my poster is number 12. Hi, my name is Linda. I'm a PhD candidate in Scott Lab. A T-cell mediated pro-inflammatory response is critical for cancer cell elimination. Our lab has manufactured a novel cell-free allo recognition based therapeutic from both the human and murine systems. We call this therapeutic IA1, and IA1 enhances a pro-inflammatory response in naive T-cells and those activated immune T-cells uh, significantly attenuate the cancer cell elimination. Moreover, we found that the extracellular microRNA enriched fraction mediated the majority of the anti-cancer effects and the cross-species efficacy of IA1. Feel free to pay me a visit at poster number 16 if you want to know more details about IA1. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Frank. I'm a PhD student in the Prizedale lab. Um, factor V is, is an essential coagulation protein that's critical for normal blood clotting. Uh, for my project, I'm interested in the mechanism by which plasma cleaves and converts factor V from a procoagulant to fibrinolysis cofactor. And this is really interesting because factor V may play dual roles in hemostasis, in coagulation, and fibrinolysis. If you'd like to know more, I'll be at poster number seven. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sri Prana from Kirakeratu Lab. My poster today is about novel DNA inhibitors. DNA is placed safely inside the cell, but in some cases, it can come to the bloodstream and become cell-free and activate uh, thrombosis or make the blood more clotty. So we are developing inhibitors that target DNA to prevent thrombosis associated with them. If you want to know more about these inhibitors, come check out my poster at poster number 11. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm also in Jay's group. Um, one of the interesting things about our group is that we're actually a pretty multidis multidisciplinary team of researchers. So I'm actually one of the students in the Department of Chemistry in Jay's group. And uh, what my research focuses on is in the design and synthesis of a polyphosphate inhibitor with the goal of developing a safe and effective antithrombotic agent. So if you come check out my poster at poster number 20, I promise I won't bore you with too much chemistry.
Hi, my name is Brian Lin, from a PhD candidate in the Ed Prizel's lab, working towards a broad-spectrum antiviral strategy against viruses that affect our hemostatic system, leading to bleeding or clotting. This is based on our, our studies that show that two very distinct viruses, virus families, represented by the cold sore virus, HSV1, and dengue virus, can incorporate the host initiators of coagulation, tissue factor, and phospholipid onto its outer membrane structure. This has allowed HSV1 to enhance infection in vitro and in vivo. I've also shown that HSV1 can, has evolved its own virus protein, glycoprotein C, to enhance tissue factor function by mimicking its cofactor function. If you're interested in learning more, please visit my poster at number eight. Hi, I'm uh, Nathaniel uh, from the Sternaca Lab. I study late-stage peptidoglycan biosynthesis. If you'd like to learn more, please visit me at poster number five. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jeff. I'm a master's student in the Hugh Kim Lab. The title of my project is, uh, sorry, <laughs> is uh, platelet signaling juvenile, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and specifically, we're looking at whether platelet-derived molecules can induce the reduction of cartilage-degrading MMPs in chondrocytes, which are the cellular constituent in cartilage, and our more immediate focus right now is developing a 3D hydrogel-based matrix to culture these cells to promote a more physiological phenotype. So if you want to learn anything about either of those two topics, come see me at post number four. Thanks. I'm not sure how we caught up on that time, but anyway, we will reconvene at 1.20, so go enjoy your lunch and uh, all those tastes that you got of those posters. Please follow them up by visiting those students and, uh, um, and enjoy. <laughs>